Good morning to everybody who's joining this view on Africa, coming to you from the Institute for Security Studies, Pretoria. This VOA provides analytical insight into the political implications of the upcoming July 16th legislative elections in the Republic of Congo. And this is not to be confused with its larger neighbor, the Democratic Republic of Congo, to its south and east. I am Fonte Akum, senior researcher in the Peace and Security Research Program out here, and my presentation today is based on a recent research trip I took to Congo Brazzaville in late April and May of this year. And during this trip, I engaged with civil society actors, youth activists, academics, and political actors from across the spectrum. And that is the research that would actually inform a lot of my presentation today, because through this engagement, I tried to get a pulse on what has been described as a multi-dimensional crisis in the Republic of Congo. Now, for historical background, in 1991, Congo created precedent in the Central Africa region by organizing the first national conference. This national conference broke with the monolithic party military state past, which had been instituted since Marie Nguabi took over power in a coup in 1968. And the national conference introduced multi-party politics in Congo. Now, the resulting constitution of 15th March 1992 provided the legal framework for Congo's first republic of the multi-party era, which came with a name change, a new flag, and a new anthem to complement a democratic transition of power from one president, Denis Sassou to another, Pascal Isuba, and the configuration of a multi-party parliament. However, it would take more than the symbolic washing of hands by then President Sassou Nguesso and his arch rival of the time, Joachim Yombi Opango, at the reflecting pool of the National Assembly in Brazzaville to break with Congo's past. And in more ways than one, Congo's political woes resided more in its political class and an entrenched and pervasive governance culture rather than in a constitution although obviously a new constitution was needed to usher in multi-party democracy. Now, a country with Congo's natural resource endowments, better governed, should easily sustain annual growth rate, GDP growth rate of above 5%, rather than remain vulnerable to the vagaries of fluctuating oil prices. Therefore, and given the economic and political configuration of Congo, it wasn't long before pressures from social contestation, intense personalization of politics, the militarization and regionalization of political parties, coupled with economic problems, pushed Congo into civil war in June 1997. And this civil war brought into common parlance monikers like the Cobras representing the militias supporting former President Sassou Nguesso, the ninjas supporting Bernard Kulila, who was then mayor of Brazzaville, and the Kokoyes, who were the militia forces supporting then President Pascal Lisuba. Now, this civil war, which ended in 1997, ushers in the next episode in Congolese history, which we are currently witnessing, and which could be appropriately titled Sasongeso, a military comeback and foxy political consolidation. And you would understand why as we proceed. Now, after decisively winning the civil war in October 1997 with Angolan support, former military strongman Denis Sasongeso led a transitional government of national unity, which, despite some setbacks given that it was coming out of war, developed a constitution intended to promote peace and foster reconciliation. Now, the post-war constitution adopted on the 20th of January 2002 was very much a victor's constitution, tailored to President Sassou Nguesso's political ambitions at the time. After winning the 2002 presidential elections, 
after the adoption of the constitution, and then winning re-election in a contest largely boycotted by the opposition in 2009, President Sasson Gesso was constitutionally expected to serve his last term. However, like most African strongmen, he used a succession of well-orchestrated and choreographed political dialogues to pave the way for constitutional reform and regime durability. Now, a new constitution was adopted in Congo Brazzaville in October 2015, despite calls for a boycott by opposition parties. And this, the adoption of this new constitution actually set the mark for the immediate causes of Congo's current political crisis. The 2015 constitution reinstituted the position of prime minister, who is appointed by the president. Now, the simultaneous, simul simultaneous importance and irrelevance of the upcoming legislative elections can be gleaned from three institutional observations about the 2015 constitution. Firstly, it eliminates the presidential and legislative independence clauses that were adopted in the 2002 constitution, and we could come to that in the discussion. Secondly, it insulates the president from parliamentary censure, making the prime minister, who is appointed by the president, the highest member of the executive branch liable to censure. And finally, it returns to the president the prerogative to dissolve the National Assembly in the event of what quote unquote is assumed to be a persistent crisis between the government and the legislature that would hamper the smooth functioning of state institutions. Isn't that foxy? Now, this effectively, this new constitution effectively tips the balance of power rather decisively in favor of the president, who is not liable to censure from any part of the state institutional apparatus, right? Hence, the importance and irrelevance of the upcoming legislative elections. Now, the constitutional reform process of 2015 effectively polarized Cong Congo's political landscape, highlighting stark opposition for and against constitutional reform. There were the groups which were Sasui, that is more of Sasu, and there was another group which was Sasufi, which was enough of the Sasu regime. Now, while the presidential majority, through a number of spokesmen, described as a process, a constitutional review process necessitated to adapt the country to evolving political context, the opposition described a constitutional coup tantamount to the institutionalization of illegality and imposture. Now, what's at stake in the July 16th legislative elections, right? Firstly, the boycott of these elections by the EDC Fokad CG3 M platform denounces the deepening farce that elections have become in Congo Brazzaville. And it puts serious question marks on the credibility of the upcoming elections. Secondly, convening the elections amid a political crisis and a military crisis in the Pool region indicates that Sasung, the Sasungeso regime needs any political legitimation it can get. And this legitimation is necessary as it negotiates an economic recovery package with international financial institutions. Now, taking more loans, which would be paid by future generations, right? Not those in power today. However, forcing through the elections also exhibits the fragility of the current regime, which increasingly bases its governance not on the comprehensive social contract or compact, but on an over-reliance on coercive instruments of state. Now, by forcing through the completion of the new republic's institutional edifice, it risks actually deepening and exacerbating internal fractures. Despite assurances from the Ministry of Interior and the Independent National Electoral Commission, almost none of the electoral governance reforms agreed to at the 2011 EWO political dialogues have, have been adopted. Now, 
This political dialogue raised important issues pertaining to timing, that is the sequencing of elections, pre-planning elections, and the successful execution of elections when they take place, issues of representation at the level of registration, voter registration, and within voting offices, and overall reform of electoral governance and operations. Now, the regime's cynical name change from the Cornell National Elections Organization Commission to the CENI in 2015 barely masks the fact that the same person, Henry Booker, who led the Cornell, continues to lead CENI. And the cosmic, cosmetic changes alter nothing fundamentally to the practice of electoral rigging, which has been normal in Congo Brazzaville. Now, on resolved issues relating to the composition of electoral registers, which arose during the 2009 presidential elections, remain largely ignored. This is compounded by the post-presidential election of, 2000, of March 2016, imprisonment of opposition political leaders, the refusal to grant permits for public demonstrations to segments of the civil society and the opposition, restricting the circulation of some opposition leaders to within Brazzaville city limits, and the occasional interruption of internet services and all these pra practices exhibit the lengths to which the regime goes to clamp down on political opposition, limiting individual and collective choices and co collective rights, if you pardon me. Now, the question goes, how can free and fair elections be held under these conditions? What we see today as possible implications are that preconditions exist for the legislative and local elections coming up in July to trigger local, localized pockets of political violence. Fear of violence could actually depress voter participation in most areas as well. Meanwhile, in fairly safe areas, control, uh, which are normally the bastions for the Congolese Labour Party, like the Cuvet, the Western Cuvette, the Sangha, and the Likwala regions, turnout would speak volumes as to the ruling party's popularity. Overall, though, fewer Congolese are likely to turn out for, for the, to the polls during the legislative elections that would have, than would have participated if the elections were better governed, more serene, and robust, robustly organized. Now, the Congolese Labour Party and its allies would most likely secure over 55 to 7% majority, scoring between 83 to 105 seats in the new assembly, which should be made up of 151 delegates going up from 139 who were seated at the legislature since 2012. The, the Congolese ruling party, which goes by the acronym PCT in French, which benefits from access to state resources, remains the only viable party to compete for most of the states of the seats at the legislature. And their recent list of released um, legislative candidates actually features 132 candidates competing, while a party like the UPADES actually is submitting only 43 candidates, because I'm sure that's all they can afford. However, it's worth noting that these elections are unlikely to calm the political tensions simmering in Congo Brazzaville, and neither are they likely to provide the political legitimation that the Sasson Gesso regime needs to govern until 2021. And unless an internationally mediated inclusive political dialogue that addresses the root causes of Congo's political, social and economic crisis is undertaken, it is difficult to see how the situation would be de-escalated. This is even more important given that the entire Central African region is suffering from a number of pressures at the moment. Whether you're talking about maritime insecurity within the Gulf of Guinea, or the Boko Haram insurgency to the north, or continuing tensions in the Central African Republic, where 
A Congolese peacekeeping contingent was recently sent back home by the United Nations. Now, given the current regional context, greater international attention needs to be placed to negotiate a peaceful resolution to Congo's political crisis that focuses on enhancing human security and the protection of human liberties.